So we need to talk about types of mixtures, and to do that, we need to back up just a second and talk about how matter is uh, classified. So if you look at this um, graphic here, you can see that matter, um, anything that has mass or takes up space, can be broken into two different types, a pure substance and a mixture. Pure substance is what we've been talking about, where it breaks into elements and compounds. Uh, now we're going to talk about mixtures. And in mixtures, we have both homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures. Now, again, uh, matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. So um, we've got lots of different examples there. Remember, states of matter, solid, liquid, gas, and occasionally plasma. Um, all atoms in a sample of matter with the same atomic number or number of protons make up an element. Um, Compounds are two or more elements that are chemically bonded. Okay, so this is not mixed together like a salad. These are chemically bonded. Um, and then mixtures can be both homogeneous and heterogeneous. Um, homogeneous mixtures um, are uniform throughout, and they are better known as solutions. And heterogeneous mixtures are not uniform without um, it could be like a tossed salad or fruit salad where depending on which spoonful you get, you might get different types of fruit and or vegetables. Um, and the different types of heterogeneous mixtures that we talk about are suspensions and goiloids. Um, so again, homogeneous, uniform without, heterogeneous, not uniform. Now, in homogeneous mixtures or solutions, we have two major parts, the solute and the solvent. Uh, the solute is usually the smaller part of the um, mixture or solution, and it is what is being dissolved, and the solvent is usually a larger portion of the mixture, and it is what does the dissolving. Um, so if you look at this picture, um, we notice that the sugar, we assume, is what is the solute, and the solvent would be the coffee. Um, it's important to note that water is the universal solvent, um, mostly because um, it is polar, so it does dissolve most things, and also it is a pH of 7, so it's not corrosive, and it's able to dissolve things without ruining or, or the integrity of whatever is being uh, dissolved. A suspension mixture is a heterogeneous mixture with large solute particles, and the particles will settle over time. So in a suspension, particles will not they suspend it, they will eventually settle, and you see this snow globe is a perfect example of a suspension mixture. In a colloid mixture, we still are heterogeneous, but the particles are a little bit smaller, and they remain dispersed over time. Um, and we have lots of different examples. Uh, Jello, providing that you mix it up properly, will stay um, dispersed. Uh, milk, mayonnaise, um, and several other things, colloids. The Tyndall effect is a light effect that um, is a scattering of particles in a colloid or a suspension mixture. So if you can look at this picture here, you notice that there is no visible scattering of particles here, but we do have visible scattering here in the colloid um, and the suspension um, because the particles are larger um, in the solution, the particles are gonna be much smaller. This is a better picture here. Okay. Now, the next thing we're going to discuss is solubility. Solubility is the amount of substance required to form a saturated solution with a specific amount of solvent at a specific temperature. Okay. All that to say is solubility is the amount of solute that can be dissolved in a specified amount of solvent. Okay, saturation is when you have put the maximum amount of solute in your solvent. Um, any more in it, the solute will settle to the bottom, um, and any less, it will be dilute, and you will still be able to add more uh, solute. Okay, now we have a couple of terms that we need to know. <clears throat> this line right here is the solubility of, let's see. I don't think it says what, but it's the solubility of whatever particular solute that this is a graph of. And at each temperature, you notice you can get a little bit more solute 
in the um, solution. So that does change. So this line here is considered the line of saturation. That is the point um, where you can no longer put any more. So if you put any more solute in, it becomes super saturated, which means you put more solute in the solvent or in the solution than it can hold, and it will start to settle out. Um, unsaturated is when we still could put more. So at 60 degrees, um, I could put 80 and it would be unsaturated. I could put 120 and it would be super saturated. So this would be too much, this area above the line, and this would be not enough, the area below the line. And then again, saturation would be on the line. Now, solubility curves are usually presented like this, where you have multiple salts or solutes in the same curve, and then you can compare the solubility of KCl to KClO3, um, and you can see that all of these are in 100 grams of water, and that's usually how they are. They're all in the same amount of solute um, so that you can compare um, how the temperature change affects the solubility. And if you notice that for everything but one of these salts, an increase in temperature will increase solubility. Um, if you notice here, the cesium sulfate or cerium sulfate actually does not increase um, with temperature. So that is unusual, but there are some uh, chemicals or some salts that actually do um, react that way. Also, you can see that like NaCl has very low reaction to increase temperature, whereas something like KNO3 has a very much more severe um, increase when you increase the temperature. So that's how you work the solubility curve. Now here are a couple of questions that you can work through with this solubility curve and then see um, if you understand how to read it. And if you're in class, we will do go through these together so you can see.